welcome friends um, to the uh, repeat program of the myths and mysteries of migration. We've just uh, come through uh, World Migration Day. This is the motto for this year. I didn't uh, find this particularly inspiring. So in keeping with today's program, I went back a few years and I felt that these, uh, these best represented what we're going to look at today, that birds need our help and that birds are truly citizens of the world. We tend to think of them in our locale, uh, but most of the time they're just passing through. So first of all, let's be clear what migration is, and you can read this, but it basically means that they are optimizing their existence. One of the reasons this is so important is because how few birds make it through their first year and then how few first year birds make it through the second year. So we hear stories of, of, of birds making you know, some longevity, but mostly conditions are harsh, the threats are real. So anything birds can do to improve the likely, likelihood that they will survive to pass on their genes is important and migration is one of those things. So this is the roadmap of where we're going today. Uh, we now know what migration is. We can look at what birds are. What are those strange creatures? Um, the early myths. I've for this uh, presentation, I've shortened that a little bit. This is about the 20th time I've given this program. It's different every time. What we're going to look at is actually how migration occurs, the real mysteries of it where the birds are, when they're there, some extreme migrants. And the real core of the program is why do they migrate? We know that's to maximize opportunity and how do they do it? And that's where the magic really begins. But as we all know, um, I know who's uh, watching here tonight, there are terrible challenges for the climate, for the planet, and for migrants, but we have some ideas about action plans. So this is actually a short number. They're probably closer to 11,000 bird species. About 40% of those species migrate. Some of them total migrations, like the Arctic turn from pole to pole. Others, uh, shorter migrations, but each species develop that strategy independently. Uh, a bird tried it, it worked. They produced more, so their offspring uh, tried the same strategy. But migratory birds don't always migrate. It's very dangerous to do. And occasionally, especially here in Florida, we will see birds on the beaches uh, in full breeding plumage. They're supposed to be in the high tundra, but they, they choose to not Take, undertake the, the round trip. The birds we see on Florida's beaches are in all sorts of um, plumages, so identification can be really tricky for us. And with the seasonal plumage, you would look at this and say, what is this bird? Now I know for this audience, you know exactly what this bird is. It's a black-bellied plover. Um, but if we're, ident if we're gonna uh, understand migration, we have to identify birds in all sorts of locations and in all sorts of plumages. So what are birds? Well, I think it's uh, pretty well accepted, although there are some, some pockets in the scientific community who do not accept this uh, theory about the KT extinction, where we know that fully 75% of the world's species were rendered extinct, was not habitable planet. All the non-avian and many of the avian dinosaurs perished, but many avian dinosaurs survived. And we know what avian dinosaurs were. They had uh, little proto feathers, they laid eggs, some of them still had teeth, some of them were big, some of them small. Uh, those feathers, were they for insulation, decoration? There's some doubt as to whether they were ever for flight, but recently they're in China, well-preserved fossil. Uh, they were able to extract uh, keratin from the fossil. 
It's very similar to the uh, keratin in modern bird feathers, suggesting that if they weren't flying by then, they were getting very close to flying uh, once they get all the barbs and barbell, barbules in. And so birds all over the world had to adapt to various ecosystems. Um, these are particularly um, interesting to me in New Zealand where there were no mammals. And so birds evolved in a certain way. Um, they didn't need to fly, they didn't need to flee. But birds adapted to a variety of ecosystems. And while there's not gonna be a test, just keeping in mind that an ecosystem is the interrelationship of organisms within the environment. And that's what we need to keep in mind when we think about birds moving through space, time and space. So the first, the oldest record of birds, and birds around millions of years before we were starting to record them, but the oldest human record of a bird, I also want to say ginormous, at Geniornis newtoni is a bird that went extinct about 50,000 years ago uh, at about the time or shortly after the Aboriginal people landed in Australia. So that's our oldest, a flightless bird, oldest recorded bird. When, and not surprisingly, once, um, deities came into existence, they were frequently given bird characteristics. Birds, birds could fly, they were a different part of the universe. What is the first written record of a bird? Well, it's not exactly migration, but the bird flew out, the bird flew back. So we're gonna give it credit for effort. And this uh, historically would have occurred around 4,000 BC, but before Christian era, but recorded quite a bit later in those first chapters of the First Testament. The first recorded migration was in Exodus, a little later. Uh, this is the first fallout, and you all know that when birds flying overnight and then either weather or exhaustion hits them and they all come falling out of the air together. So the, the quail was the first recorded migration. Migration was mentioned in poetry by Homer. Uh, they knew that the cranes went south. What they did when they got there, was, that's another was a, a, a black hole that we could go into because they're fighting the pygmy men on the shores and we're not really sure how historically accurate that is. First mentioned in a learned treatise, Aristotle, he got a lot of things right. He, he, very careful observer of nature. Um, he believed, uh, unfortunately, he got a lot of things wrong. He believed that birds shed their feathers, went into mud banks and emerged as new species in the spring. But he made some very careful observations about migration. The first uh, domestication of raptors gave uh, provide an opportunity to see a lot more about what birds did and frederick the second holy roman emperor took the art of hunting with birds noted that birds changed their altitude so it wasn't just a matter of birds moving or passing through they would stay local but they would go up the mountains for cooler weather my very favorite, now you have to understand this is in the 1600s, 1700s, this is well before Darwin and the understanding of naturally the pressures of natural selection. The universe, God made the universe entire. He wouldn't have just done this one little planet. He would have made everything, would have had lakes and trees and streams and rivers. And when the birds disappeared, where else would they possibly go? They would have made no, no sense. They, of course, they went to the moon. A particularly sweet part of this is that the little birds were known to meet and assist, and so it was believed that the bigger birds gave the little birds um, a, a piggyback. So we're going to understand migration. You really need to know where are the birds and when are they there? Now, this was something that was impossible to know for most of human history uh, because people never left their village. They didn't travel um, 
they were just watching things, watching birds pass over. And when they were gone, they were very, very gone. When birds began to be studied, it was taxonomic study. And this involved a lot of killing of birds and not a lot of behavioral understanding. And this is, uh, of course, John J. Audubon, who, to the best of my knowledge, never regretted the wholesale slaughter. I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful pictures. Um, the, fir the first Audubon was established by George Bird Grinnell. And he was a, a pioneer in the conservation movement. And the story is complicated, but he did, through a magazine subscription, create the first Audubon Society. He called it Audubon. Now, he didn't know John James. They had a two-year overlap in lifespan. But he knew uh, Lucy. He knew Lu uh, Audubon's widow. They were neighbors. And she was his teacher. She was his mother's substitute. Um, so that was his connection to Audubon and therefore the popularization of the Audubon Society. Generation later over in Europe, Otto Hermann had started out shooting birds and he got heartily sick of it. He said, this is, we're, not, we're not really learning anything that we need to know about birds. And so he challenged the Fourth International Congress he said, we need to be asking questions about behavior and migration is the biggest thing. And he challenged with these specific questions. Are there roots or are there not definite roots? Do they learn to migrate or do they act on instinct? And the answer to this is yes, 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 yes. It's all, it's all yes. There are, and we'll see that as we go a little further along. But the die was cast, the, the extravagant slaughter of birds for the fashion industry was really taking a toll and birds were nearing extinction. And um, I'm sure all of you or many of you have read accounts of what went on in the Everglades. It was truly cruel. And so women particularly drove, uh, first they drove the fashion consciousness and then they drove the opposition and the introduction of Audubonets. So these were featherless, it was virtue signaling, uh, women wearing feathers were shamed, local state chapters of Audubon started to be formed, uh, nominally by men but mostly women were the driving factor behind it and this effort eventually led to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Other efforts, Frank Chapman for the Smithsonian, uh, Christmas bird shoots, the women or their servants were making Christmas dinner, the men went out and slaughtered as many birds as they possibly could, and he was the gentleman behind the Christmas bird count, which we, I'm sure most of us participate. Now, Around 1900, this is going to be a, still an activity of white privilege. Uh, the only people who would have binoculars, uh, but most most birders were out there uh, birding by ear. But then uh, the um, the development of affordable portable binoculars and other optics, the birding um, birding information age dawned. We still needed to figure out who we were, which birds were where. And so that's when banding, this is called ringing in the rest of the world, banding, but individual birds anyway, could be tracked. And, and when they're either spotted again or their carcass was found, you could pin them down for when they were, when they were seen. So you got a very sketchy notion of where birds were, but it was certainly better than nothing. And that, information, the inimitable Roger Tory Peterson, who by the way was, was uh, reported to have a hearing and a range, superhuman hearing, his ability to hear, and he put out these range maps, and this is a range map on the left showing uh, summer uh, breeding, year-round migration, and that worked really well for a bird that stayed in North America. 
But let's take a look at the black-bellied plover. Tells us where it's in migration, because flying across most of the country, it breeds in the far north, and then uh, comes back and it hangs out in the Caribbean and the in Florida. We have a lot of, we're lucky to have a lot of them here on our beaches. But that is just not the whole story. Because if you can see here, there's a concentration, surely here, but these birds come all the way flying all the way down here, all the way down to the south tip of South America. So this is telling us another, a whole different story about the challenges and opportunities for this bird. This is another black-bellied plover. If you ever, depending on the plumage, if it's not a breeding plumage, this is a, a great marker, this, um, this black axillary, only the uh, prairie falcon is the only other bird that has that, and you are unlikely to mistake those. So eBird was behind all these new sightings. This is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I don't have a good relationship with eBird. I need to, I need to make nice and make up with them. But every time there's a sighting, you, you post it, it's a ping, and you can see over the course of a week or so, the population of indigo buntings uh, arriving in and then through the US. And so this, um, I, I could have updated, this was from the last uh, presentation, but shows us where the birds are. And, and why this matters is because birds are affected by light, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But this gives us the uh, bird intensity. And this is, uh, so we're going to see, this is night is falling. We can see night is falling across the continent. And so now we're really picking up on radar all of these birds. And we're going to see this, and they're going to fly, fly, fly. You can see that intense band through the central flyway and birds are active, birds are active. Here comes dawn, whoop, down they go, down they go, and down they go. So this is very helpful uh, for action, light outs, action alerts, and it's understood that uh, we need to do this. So there's a lot of cooperation between municipalities, Cornell, and these bird cuts. But all of those, um, these just tell us sort of how many birds there are. Um, we can't count individual birds, or if we can get a sense of it within the, the, the thousand, we really don't know which birds are out there. And there's now a way to, to, um, to know that. This is using cutting edge technology on the left of these microchip uh, transmitters and the old VHF, um, aerials, the receivers on the right, you can see that. And these are now so tiny, they're strapped on like, uh, almost like britches, or almost like those of us who put on a harness for binoculars, either put on harness over the bird's thighs, uh, put on the back. And motus, by the way, is Latin for movement. And so this is tracking the wildlife in ways that were incomprehensible. Every tag has a unique signature, and every it's picked up by every single antenna. So if you have antennas all over the place, this started in Canada, by the way, Alain, um, but if you have uh, antennas all over the place, you can follow an individual bird. And so if you're looking after not hatches, you put it up in an antenna, it's going to take the information on every single other bird that flies by, all can be downloaded. So this is a real uh, cooperative effort and the ability to predict with some precision where birds are going to be landing at different times. So we used to get this kind of information about birds, you know, here are the flyways, yeah, sure, we know they go, they go up, they come back a different way, we kind of see that, and that's what we had, and we were happy with it. And now, because of MOTIS, this is what we have. Each individual bird is tagged. In my particular, this uh, gray tree cheeked thrush down here was tagged. He hung around for a little while, and then took off like a bullet. And as it says, he, he made it to 
3,674 3, kilometers, 13 days, averaging 283 kilometers a day. So this is a very different set of information. It's very precise. We can see what individual birds within species are doing, the range of that. Why does that matter? I mean, it's fabulous, but why does it matter? It matters because of conservation. If you know that your birds are coming in over a 500 square mile area, it's gonna be very hard to get the management, the funds and the dedicated land for that. If you can really pin down where, where the birds are landing, the efforts, uh, the conservation efforts are much more likely to be successful, much more targeted. And we're gonna talk about that the marathon flight of the bar-tailed godwit. Now, E7 started down here, and she was actually at the Thames estuary on the North Island. They know that bar-tailed godwits spend the, uh, the northern summer in Alaska breeding, then come back. Kind of, this is just, I don't know what's going on here, but anyway, they come back in their New Zealand. What they cared about, what was, what, what the scientists the, um, wanted to know was what was going on in China. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So anyway, they, tra they outfitted E7 with a trans uh, transmitter. She goes up to the Yellow Sea. She goes over to Alaska. And by now the battery is supposed to have faded and that's all they wanted to know. They really wanted to know about what was going on or where, they were, where these birds were going in the Yellow Sea, her battery continued and she was tracked coming all the way through the, uh, through the, across the Pacific nonstop for eight, for eight days, 7,500 miles in eight days without a stop. And if you think about that just for a second, say you're the chick of B7, who by the way is not gonna lead the way for you, you're the chick of E7 and you leave Alaska and you got to find this pinpoint. How you do, they do it. They surely do it. But anyway, let's not digress. Let's get back to the China Sea, the Yellow Sea. Anyway, so she does this because of a thing called unihemispheric slow wave sleep. Uh, birds, this bird is probably three quarters asleep. Birds fly on the wing. They can have one eye open at a time. They can do this for seconds or minutes. Um, magnificent frigate birds do it for prolonged periods. This is not unusual in the animal world. All marine mammals have to do this, otherwise they would drown. So you know, dolphins and so forth, they all do this. And that's how this, this works for them in a number of other ways, but it helps with these um, long distance migrations because they can sleep and fly at the same time. So the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, with the, uh, both of the Koreas, Japan, China, Australia, they wanted to know what was going on, where these birds were going on in the Yellow Sea, because there was a tremendous, and it probably still is, a tremendous pressure on these stopover grounds. And this is, as we call it, the flyway hub. I won't spend too long on this, but here's the, this is the flyway. Here is the hub of this entire flyway. And these brown spots, these brown areas are square miles of destroyed mudflats. The mudflats go out for miles, it's very shallow, uh, go out for many miles. And what's happening is there, it's called reclamation. They're not reclaiming anything, they are actually destroying mud flats, they're creating dry land for agriculture and industry, and they are robbing these, uh, I think these are bar tail god, what's down here, but robbing these um, many, many species of migratory shorebirds of critical fly habitat that they need, they're not breeding there, but they need these, these stopovers in migration. And so with the assist of the godwits and then up here this charming little very very um seriously endangered spoonbill sandpiper uh, 
Sandpiper, Hank Paulson, once he left, um, left public life, he and his wife, and together with a, a large consortium, uh, negotiated with the countries around the Yellow Sea to uh, put an end to the so-called reclamation. Oh, I meant, I meant to uh, change the typing of Ramsar. It's not Ramsar, Ramsar sites on the Yellow Sea. And a Ramsar site, by the way, it's named for uh, the 50th anniversary of um, a treaty developed in Iran to, pr to protect these areas. And so that is what's going on now, more of that in the Yellow Sea, as opposed to these hardscaped uh, terminals and ports in Korea. So that is why we care about conservation and where birds are going. So why do birds migrate? We know this answer. So this is the test. They migrate to get the most amount of food they can at any given time. They have optimal energy balance. Easy food. I love a ground thrasher. We have a lot around my house right now. And then coordinate breeding with that maximum food availability, and particularly our little treasures down here, which we're going to talk about in a bit. But why the Arctic? That's an awful long way to go. Well, there is an annual explosion of biomass. So a bird, if a bird um, is getting uh, an insect every two seconds, as opposed to a bird getting an insect every four seconds, where they've lost half of their food. But if you have a bird getting an insect every one second, they're really able to uh, get a lot done with that trophic transfer to their uh, to their chicks. 24 hours of daylight, and we know what they can do, right? We do. They can stay awake all night and feed their chicks. They don't need to go to sleep. So you've got 24 hours of daylight. They can have this incredible biomass, so they maximize uh, the trophic, um, the gathering, and they can feed their chicks pretty much around the clock. And this will improve the number of offspring dramatically. Now, how many of them get through the first year is a problem. If you have one, the likelihood that one is not going to make it through, but this on the side, you maybe have uh, at least two of those that survive. So that's viable. Now, just briefly, their spring migration and fall migration are very different events. In the spring, they, the birds have to arrive at their breeding ground uh, with a lot of fat reserves. Um, they have to find a territory, find a mate, and they'll come up in, in waves, but they will really concentrate their breeding this is a species strategy, not an, uh, an individual strategy. Um, the, pe the ones that come up early may arrive and there's not enough food. The ones who come late may arrive and there are not enough mates or, um, or territories. But there are times when conditions will, f will really favor the outliers. There are times when conditions will favor the bulk of, of the birds. Uh, if you're on the outside, it's not uh, as safe for you, but uh, it's, it's uh, clearly the safest thing for the species as a whole. So that's spring migration. Fall migration is quite different. Staggered returns, yes, but it's, you know, the failed breeders or the breeders, um, who, you know, who lost their chicks or didn't find a mate, didn't find a territory. Very often the adults leave the, uh, the fledglings to fend for themselves and they'll come along a few days later. And they often fly in mixed flocks and, and they have no need for fat reserves because when they arrive at their wintering grounds, they're just hanging out. Well, they're hanging out working hard and feeding, but they don't have to uh, produce eggs. They don't have to um, raise their chicks. Now, what's the point with a mixed flock? Well, anybody on, on the line who's a, a master naturalist is calling out resource partitioning. Well, that's exactly right, because they are not competing for the same resource. Each of, their, each of these birds has a different bill, different feeding style, 
a different level of um, nerve endings or flexibility. A lot of these bills look straight and hard to us, but they're actually quite flexible at the end. They can flare open. They can. It's another whole story. We're gonna have to do it. We have to do a story about uh, beaks someday. But that is um, why they fly in mixed flocks, and they fly to widely dispersed destinations. So now we get to the real heart of it. How do they do it? We know why they do it, know where they do it. How do they do it? The little guy up here has maybe changed his mind, but mostly uh, there's a lot of commonality. There's a lot of overlap. There are a lot of redundant systems. So it's first thing to ask ourselves, well, what triggers migration in a bird? And now this is something Again, there won't be a test, but this is something you're going to want to remember because this is where we get into trouble. One of the ways to get into trouble is the photo period. Now, they're not sitting with a clock, you know, with a watch, but it is the photo period and considering the weather and all other things, they're going to uh, wait for the time. And over millennia, over maybe 65 million years, they've learned that if they go at a certain time they'll arrive at a certain place and there will be this biomass so this is so they have learned this and they uh, something they have is called zugenruha and it is it's once they get this and i think it's more particularly true of songbirds and other birds but once they get zugenruha they it's irresistible and this was demonstrated by Stephen Emlin, I think the University of Michigan. He had this poor little bird and an ink pad, and he showed that come, um, come uh, spring, they want to go north, come fall, they want to go south, and there's just nothing in the way. Uh, if you haven't read the book, uh, The Bluebird Effect by Julie Zigafus, she's a songbird rehabilitator, and she describes uh, some of the behaviors of birds who are desperate, agitatedly restless tail. Well, they got to physically prepare. You just don't walk out the door. And they have an ability, the metabolism of a bird is phenomenal in that it can swing from these incredible extremes. So the first thing they do is become obese. And then they shut their gut down. They don't need it anymore so that they don't have to have any energy uh, for digestion. And then they adjust their metabolism. Um, I can't go, I, it's beyond my pay grade to go into the details of exactly how they do it, but, but that they do it. And they do it in a way that maximizes their oxygen efficiency because they're gonna be flying higher than they usually do, uh, different humidities, flying longer, um, so they've adjusted, so they've fattened up, they're obese, they adjust their metabolism, and then they go on a flight path. Now, a lot of these flight paths um, developed over the course of the life of the birds. So these, these birds were flying over the Himalayas before they were there. And so they have adapted, um, and this is one of the reasons they can do this, because they can make all these adjustments, you get a little improvement here. And um, so they're going through all this in these difficult uh, circumstances. All of the energy is directed to their flight muscles. And as we said earlier, when they arrive at the breeding destination, they have fat reserves and they need them. They can't, if you don't arrive with fat reserves, you're going to, um, you're not going to have the energy and strength to uh, establish territory, attract mate, and it takes a while to get that digestive system back from atrophy. So you need that extra energy. So what about the tools of the trade? Remember the questions that uh, Otto Herman asked: do, do they learn? Do they know? Is it in instinctive, or do they learn? And it is both they have an instinctive internal compass. Now, some bigger birds, the geese and so forth, will bring their young with them. Most birds will leave a few days before their fledglings are ready to go, but the first year birds know where to go. Where they run into trouble is if they run into weather and they can be blown off course and then will continue um, and, and completely miss their route, particularly on the 
Atlantic Flyway, they're blown out to sea. And a, an adult bird, an experienced bird, knows how to navigate because they have a map in their hands, in their, in their not in their hands, in their heads. And so the map is from landmarks, and those can be uh, natural, like a river or a mountain. It could be man-made landmarks. Um, but landmarks, they have memorized the route. They also can follow the angle of the sun, which is more amazing the longer you think about it, because they're moving through all of these different latitudes um, over a course of weeks, I don't know, as long as a month. But this is a real uh, challenge to be able to do this um, in flight. This would, of course, be done by your diurnal, by your daytime flyers. They are checking the angle of the sun. They're also waiting for updrafts from the thermals to get them into the air, which brings us to the way most birds migrate, which is at night to avoid uh, the predators. So how do they fly at night? These little warblers, these little, um, these, each individual bird going up, flying at night, how do they do it? Well, they can do it by celestial navigation. I took, I did explain this in earlier years. It gets complicated. You're just going to trust me. Stephen Emlem was involved in the experiments that it revolves around Betelgeuse and they turned the planets. Anyway, trust us, they can do it. But what about when it's a foggy night? No, they need some redundant uh, systems. How do they find their way? And for this, the experiments turned to pigeons who are famous for being able to find their way home. They have a map in their head. And they do this by being able to perceive something called infrasound, this extremely low uh, sound that is the sound of the earth groaning. The tectonic plates are coming together. There's the mantle. There's just this noise that is beyond our ability to hear, but the but birds can hear it and they can follow that. It's the best way I can explain it. We all know the Doppler effect, where something coming towards you is very high, and then as it, the waves go away from you, the sound wave it gets deeper. Well, it's like this, except that the Earth stays still and um, the bird is moving. But it's sort of, it really is a mirror Doppler effect. Birds can perceive the Earth's magnetic field. And this, I found, is a good place to uh, just stop it. This is the intersection of a good place to explain all of these talents, these skills, these abilities are challenged in ways that they never were uh, really until the last hundred years or so. And the perception of the Earth's magnetic field is one good way to start looking at the challenges. So remember Zugenrucha, where are you gonna go? You gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta, you just gotta go. It's spring, it's fall, you gotta go. Well, uh, Heinrich Mortensen, he wants to know what part of the brain in a bird provided that ability. They just, so he set up an experiment and he was going to have the birds in the lab and he was going to check it out. Well, his birds went, just didn't know what to do. It was completely unworkable. This little sassy pants on, on the right is just going in every which way. He just can't do it. Well, after they thought it through, they did two things. They took the experiment to the country and repeated it there. And they shielded the lab from the uh, surrounding electromagnetic field from your to everything. I mean, I'm I'm sort of drawing a blank, but you know, your your telephone, your refrigerator, your your electricity coming in. Anyway, so he they figured that out, and he concluded that it was a magneto conception. There's a a, a, a mineral in the bill and. Uh, that magnetized and, and that somehow that was perceiving uh, the magnetic field. We have it in our heads, fish have it, uh, but he was wrong. 
it's uh, the cryptochrome photoreceptor. Um, I'm going to try. When a beam of light hits the, the retina, the, is it the fovea, in the, the, this, this uh, protein splits that beam of light into two. And so the bird is perceiving the light um, in parallel. And that's the best I can do with that. Other than that, um, there's, if you could Google it, and if you want to help me explain it a little better. But, so this is what we imagine it looks like to them. But again, the electromagnetic fog is everywhere, particularly on the flyways. If you uh, look at these flyways, the East Coast, the West Coast, coming up the, uh, the Midwest, Chicago. So these birds, uh, that they're being really deprived of a core ability, um, where they have other abilities. But if there's uh, other problems, so light pollution, this is, we're almost here. Look at this. So if you're going to be a celestial navigator, you, you know, it's one thing if it's maybe overcast, but if you're in the middle of Manhattan, you're not looking up and seeing stars because of the light pollution. So this is a real challenge for birds. And speaking of Manhattan, uh, there were disasters for the birds because they would be attracted to uh, and uh, disoriented in the tribute to light. And so after some uh, negotiation, now their bird, their counters, they actually count the number of birds. And when it gets within, um, so these are the numbers from before, when, when they were on, they would have you know, almost 16,000 birds right in those lights. And now when they reach a um, 1,000 birds within the half mile that they cover, they shut them down for 20 minutes. And if you want to sign up as a volunteer for that, you might have to wait years to get your spot. And speaking of um, taller buildings, well, of sh uh, sure, bird collisions, but actually most of the bird collisions occur lower because that's where birds are. They're closer to the ground, they're in trees. Uh, not to say that these aren't dangerous for them, um, but most of the collisions do occur closer to, to the ground. There's an increased uh, in intensity and frequency of natural disasters. Birds are blown off all, all over the place. To, um, they can hunker down. Birds are able to hunker down in storms, but uh, there's only so much of that you can do. And one of the real problems is these birds are flying through all sorts of habitats to get here, but Elaine will recognize this. This is, um, this is, these are the beaches in Scarborough. Elaine, we got Higgins Beach over here on the right, and this is Pine Point over here on the left. And these birds make just a little scrape in the ground to lay their eggs. Um, but they're not being lazy. They're just trying to disguise their eggs. And um, yeah, it's very hard for people to see that this is my two week vacation. Why should I? Anyway, the town where uh, Elaine and I spend the summers has done a good job of monitoring both the piping plover and the least turns, and, but it's still, it's still difficult. But here's the big elephant in the room. Um, it's uh, the synchrony of, well, let's just get on to the next. So remember how birds are hardwired by photo period? They're just hardwired. They're gonna wait for the light. Their prey, all those insects are soft wired. And so they are, uh, the rhythm of the year it develops much more around temperature. And so when it gets warmer earlier, they are emerging from diapause. Diapause is just a really fancy way of saying insect hibernation. They put themselves into a suspended animation with an antifreeze. And then at a certain temperature, they terminate diapause, they come out, and then they're a larva for a little while. But once they become pupa, they're, they're not good for the birds. So what is going on here? This is another way of showing it. That, uh, that when it's warmer, they emerge earlier, 
and they finish their laurel phase much sooner and it's much sooner by about two weeks two weeks does that ring a bell of course it does it's two weeks for most birds between hatching and fledging um, the littler birds and so this is just now 40 years ago that this is um, this is a temporal time trophic energy match so they hatch here's the peak mass of hatching to pupa this is the larval phase of all that biomass and this is the maximum time of need they're fed and they fledge today this is just 40 years later two weeks those two magical weeks earlier birds don't you know at some point there's going to have to be some catch-up played maybe the earlier birds will be the ones to survive and then those birds will be the ones to reproduce but right now, this is not uh evolutionary timetable right here so we hatch there's nothing to eat and these fledglings don't exist so that is called temporal trophic mismatch um so you think the insects would be doing really well but they're not doing really well because there's uh, a variety of reasons the insects are critical because they are the nexus between you've got the sun and the energy plants make energy into matter and it's the insects that create the, the beginning of the trophic transfer because they eat the the plants and then animals take it from there so without these insects in the link that's and they're being um endangered and uh, many um extinctions um this is causing a real kind of cascade uh this is the proceedings of the national academy of sciences this is an issue just this um winter saying they refer to it as the death of a thousand cuts you can read this as well you know this as well as i do um and does you can measure decline in a number of ways uh, but it's all decline and the causes are numerous and they're the same um in many cases the same cause would decline across the board well it's just a cascade and so uh, the birds are among the, the insects are um not doing well birds are not doing well uh, aquatic insects are doing a little better they're not as affected yet but it's certainly uh, across the entire ecosystems it's a problem and we've seen although habitat loss so the same causes the same thousand cuts are hitting birds at every level so we've got the temporal trophic mismatch oh, we've got habitat loss uh, pesticides it's not looking really good this is a little um it's actually a little busy i might replace this but this is just gives you a real nice feeling for population change and like whoopsie do here we go now anybody who knows what this means means it spells trouble a j curve is always trouble so what if we take that j curve and scale it so remember that j curve is the blue line this is the actual population we've scaled it let me just show you that again there's that j curve the population in billions now we've got it scaled to billions and this is uh the thermodynamic equivalent of the population there's no way you can put these this would be going over backwards uh this is from the un i gave this talk a year or so ago and somebody down front said that's a lie it's a lie <laughs> Jeez, I could be wrong, but no, this came from, I went back and checked this. This came from the UN. So it's not just, it's not just population, although it is, it's what we're doing with our lives. Great example here. Um, if you are a guillemot and you're living on this island, well, pretty much you've uh, got some ice uh, pretty close to you year round and you can feed your young. Uh, if you're living here and you're still trying to feed your young, you just, you can't travel that far because uh, there's something called the edge effect. And so most of the fish are going to be around these edges and the, and you just not going to be able to get there. So there are a lot of 
uh, local consequences. And of course, the uh, permafrost decline, which is a, uh, the reverse metaphor that it's a snowball, it's, but it's a, a melting snowball. And it's just getting hot. It's just getting hot and hot and hot. And so uh, this is all having an effect on insects as well because uh, they, if they can't move, they stop breeding at a certain point. At a certain temperature, they, they can no longer breed. But this is also, uh, for those of us who live coastally or bird coastally, uh, rising sea level is going to take a lot of habitat out of inventory. So these migratory birds that come through, Elaine and I do the, um, do the bird counts in the summer at a, a really big marsh. Um, we can just lose all those mud flats. So this is a real challenge for our migratory birds. And so when there's change and we have we change, what, what are your options? Well, I, I hate to, I'm going to end on an up note, so don't get depressed yet. So the re, it boils down to you can do three things. You can move to appropriate habitat. You can change in place or you can die. And over the mass extinction events, um, the fossil record tells us that species really do try to move. Um, it's not always successful. Uh, our sedentary specialists close to my heart, the Florida scrub jays, they, they, even if not, they, they're not going to move. Changing in place is, uh, the pace of change is just not uh, practical selective pressure, can't work that way. But if you're a generalist like our, our little robin, you know, you can, you're going to find some place to go. And the good news is birds are moving. Uh, they're, they're moving across all types of species and they're going farther north. Uh, they're, getting, they're getting to uh, comfortable latitudes. And so now that you're thoroughly depressed, we can say, what can we do? Uh, we at uh, Venice Area Audubon have decided that we want to finish every single one of our programs with potential action items uh, that we can really um, do some things to, 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 uh, to make some change. So the first thing we can do is turn to our race favorite um, conservationist, uh, Doug Tallamy. And just a few years ago, he came out with this book saying, yes, everybody, we doesn't have to be uh, at a global level, it doesn't need to be. The, but meanwhile, at a local level, each of us in our own yards can make a change to for birds and insects. I mean, for the whole ecosystem, we can do this by planting native plants that support insects and birds and wildlife, and do it across seasons, like this uh, beautyberry here in Florida, and then this wild coffee these are the kinds of things. Well, there's a kind of a tendency, at least in my part, to go with the charismatics. And this is nothing wrong with this at all. But oddly enough, a lot of the uh, larvae of these charismatic butterflies are not um, delectable. In fact, they're quite toxic to many birds. Uh, the, if uh, one of the things people don't, they love, they just love butterflies. They love the butterflies, but they hate to see chewed up plants. So uh, the, my advice is to plant those in the background. But really and truly, um, we, the scale of this, while it's admirable and we should all do it, and, and I try to do it, uh, is it enough? No, says Doug it's not quite enough. We can really scale this up. We can scale it up in a huge way and this is how we do it. This book just came out, The Nature of Oaks. I highly recommend it. Um, and he says, no, we are really scaling it up. There are keystone species. They have millions and millions of leaves. Unlike our ornamentals in the garden, you can lose thousands and thousands of leaves 
and the tree can the tree can afford it and it doesn't affect the appearance and oaks host as many as 500 species of caterpillars and they're the top life supporters and so if we really want to see a lot more of this we have to be thinking less about charismatics and more about the cryptics the the moths um, they're laying a kind of ugly little creepy slug-like caterpillars who are um up in those oak trees, and that is where the that is where the birds can find them. The oak can afford to uh, lose those leaves, and the birds will be uh, provided for. Uh, this is a, a tufted titmouse, but uh, anybody who's read Doug's earlier book knows that it takes a uh, chickadees have to provide in the first two weeks till they fledge their 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 chicks, 9,000 9, caterpillars to get them fledged. So yeah, we need, we need oaks and we need ugly little caterpillars. So the other thing oaks do in winter is provide food because these insects, they don't complete their cycles necessarily on a school year. Uh, so they're going into diapause in the little nooks and crannies of these trees. Some of them are in the leaf litter. Um, so before we came along with our suet feeders, uh, these birds were, were thriving in winter climates on the, um, the, the, uh, the larval form of insects that were in diapause. Now, what, when you can go out and plant a tree tomorrow, I know you are, I'm so proud of you, uh, but don't plant a big tree. This one on the left is probably as big as you want. Anything bigger, it's going to be very hard for the oak to get its tap root in. Uh, best of all, says Doug, is to plant an acorn and don't, uh, don't rake up the litter. So this is where we get back to the thing I started with earlier, is that it's we think about birds in migration what would it's easy to think of the birds flying here the birds flying there the bird the bird no the bird is entering a variety of ecosystems it enters and interacts with all the other components so these birds have to have uh, ecosystems to enter so if you were to come into my neighborhood half of this is a barren desert it wouldn't really support any migratory birds. So in our home systems, keeping things as natural as possible, keep thinking ecosystem, 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 because that's what the birds need when they sh when they put down for an over, you know, a stopover, they need a functioning ecosystem, which is native plants. So that is the message, really. The ultimate message is if we think about birds, migratory birds the real message is that these are they have they're going through multiple ecosystems both hemispheres twice a year and they they to thrive they really do need good functioning ecosystem so to finish um birds they are endurance athletes with astonishing abilities and formidable challenges. And not the least of which is that they have to, unlike uh, sedentary birds, stationary birds, non-migratory birds, they have to integrate themselves into multiple ecosystems over vast territories in multiple systems and seasons. And if that is not uh, worthy of our admiration, I just don't know what is. But we, we obviously, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but every time I give this or every time I do research on this, I just come away more, more in awe of these magnificent creatures. So particularly on the shorebird, if you um, want to know more about shorebirds, uh, Adam Kent gave us wonderful pro, uh, presentation yesterday and that will be posted on YouTube. 
Um, I highly recommend it. I, I learned so much. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, migration, this is in alphabetical order um, or anything by Bernd Heinrich, but this is a particularly great book, The Homing Instinct. Bernd Heinrich is uh, um, a naturalist up in Maine. Um, Ken Kaufman, A Season on the Wind, he focuses his lens on um, the western shore of Lake Erie, but really um, brings it all home about uh, the challenges of migration. And of course, the, Scott Whedon saw this as another wonderful book to read, A World on the Wing.